Welcome to The Political Trenches, your local government at work, a new podcast based on local governments. That's right, we're going to be talking about local governments from here in Canada and across the world, and we're going to be dissecting some big news and talking to some people who make up local governments and the issues that are facing local governments here in Canada across the world. To join me in this new venture, I am pleased to welcome my co-host of this new show, and that is Ian McCormack, the president of Strategic Steps in Incorporated. Ian, welcome to this new partnership between the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown and Strategic Steps. Great. Uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. It's something that we as a company have been wanting to do for a long time. And me personally, because I love this sector, I've been looking forward to doing as well. And this is really an interesting venture because I think we will be able to provide some unique information and hopefully there'll be some engagement with some uh, some of our some of our listeners and watchers as well. So Chris, I'm really looking forward to this. And I am as well. So just brief background. Uh, Ian and I sort of met uh, almost a year and a half ago when he wrote his first book, Who's Driving the Greater? And we had him on the show of the Cross Border Interviews. And then his second book, The DNA of Great Leaders, we had him back on the show. And we started talking about the idea of local governments because and. I will be the first to admit, and I think there's a lot of people who might listen to this and through my series of municipal elected leaders on the cross-border interviews, municipal governments, local governments are often the forgotten governments that we don't often tend to talk about because we they're not the partisan politics. And I'm so pleased that we're going to be able to sort of start this conversation about local governments and the good, the bad, and yes, sometimes the ugly of local governments. Yeah, it's you're absolutely right about some not necessarily forgotten, but certainly lower profile, because for most of Canada, anyway, there are no political parties involved in governments, it's individuals names who show up on a ballot, not uh, not a party, whether it's a nationally recognized party or even a locally recognized party. So uh, one of the things that really intrigues me is that people are elected based on their own designs and platforms they put forward. They're judged on those as well, but they still have to work as a team with six or eight or 11 or 10 other people to get work done in their communities to look out for the best long-term interests of those communities. People often say that local government, of course, is the order of government that's closest to the people. And that's true. They're the people who pick up the garbage, who uh, cut the grass and shovel, shovel snow, who put on recreation programs, all those sorts of things that we rely on on a day-to-day basis, Chris. So it's going to be really good to talk about some of those things. And for those who might be listening to who have just kept, come to the show and who may not know who Ian and I are, I come from a political background. I used to work in Queen's Park in Ontario. Yes, I have ran twice municipally, so I do know municipal issues. I worked in a municipality in northern Alberta, so I, I kind of lived, worked, and played municipal uh, government, local governments. And I can tell you that this, this, this unique look that we're going to be taking in these episodes that are going to be released every first and third Wednesday of each month. So check it out. Subscribe to the podcast when you can. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the top news that are happening across Canada, and we're going to be diving into them in a quick format. Uh, we'll try to go into depth, and we're going to be talking about them, Ian and myself, about what's happening, because I think we need to start talking about what's happening locally because we want to make sure that people realize the issue that's happening in Merritt, BC is the same issue that's happening probably in Calgary when it comes to infrastructure upgrades, when it comes to provincial uh, municipal connections, whether it comes to zoning bylaws. So this is where this show is going to come into play. We're going to be talking about these on a large, small scale, but we're going to be bringing them to you on a bi-monthly process to talk to you. Ian, for you, I talked about my introduction to municipal politics running back in 2010 in Clarington, Ontario, and then Faust, Alberta, Big Lakes County, if you like to call it. So what was your introduction into municipal politics? Well, I think we should rename the show to the Failed Municipal Candidate podcast because uh, I, too, uh, ran locally. I ran in Strathcona County, Alberta, and uh, I can't even remember quite when, probably like 15 years ago or thereabouts, I ran in a three-person race. I got a little over 40% of the vote and still managed to lose, which I think is quite the accomplishment, really. But that didn't get rid of my passion for local government, which I'd had for a long time. So 
fast forward a few years and I started this company Strategic Steps about 10 years ago now. And uh, it's always been in my blood that I've really enjoyed learning from a wide variety of elected officials, from administrators, from citizens who have chosen to live in those communities. And having gathered so many stories and kept my interest peaked, I think it's a really good opportunity now to turn that around a little bit and share some of what we've had a chance to learn over the last decade. You made a reference to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Those things all exist, of course, but I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. I think most of it's probably good. And the news we're going to talk about is probably going to be about ideas. And uh, this ought to be somewhat conversational. And so we'd love also to hear from some of the people who are watching and listening as well as we go. I mentioned, I, uh, Chris mentioned, I, I run a company called Strategic Steps. And and we work kind of in that space between elected officials and senior managers. So we get involved with councils through orientations or through workshops of various types and sorts. Uh, we get involved with long-term thinking with things like strategy. We get into some of the nitty gritty with bylaws and policy. And then sometimes, speaking of the ugly, we actually get asked to help from time to time, identify where problems are. But all of that has led to a very similar conclusion, Chris, the one you said that you find that, I can't remember if it was Terrace in Calgary or somewhere, have very similar issues where the specifics might be different, but the core of those issues tends to be the same. And whether it is downloading of uh, responsibility without downloading authority or downloading commensurate resources, whether it's dealing with long-term capital degradation over time and how to fund that sort of stuff, whether it's how to bring people to town and how to keep people in town or how to pivot towards a new and sustainable economy. You could even throw things like COVID into the mix as well, where there have been some changes which were forced on a lot of local governments, even things like virtual meetings, some of which are uh, have been beneficial and are being kept uh, after the fact. So we're, we're now looking at more things like virtual meetings. We're looking at greater emphasis on health and safety, on work-life balance. We're looking at different ways that municipalities offer services and programs as well, all of which essentially we'll get a chance to talk to over time, but that's coming up in the next little while. And as Ian said, you can reach out and give us feedback, give us feedback, reach out. If you see a story that's happening in your municipality, send us a message. We have an email set up the political trenches at gmail.com. We can be found on Facebook. We can be found on Twitter. Uh, please check us out. Follow us. We we have updates of what's going on municipally around Canada right now with a lot of elections that are going on municipally, but also some by-elections, some big news stories. If there's a CAO that resigns, we'll be bringing that news to you via those Twitter um, and Facebook updates. So please, like I said, the political trenches at gmail.com. If you want to send us an, uh, an email about what you are seeing in your local municipality, please do that because we want to be able to be an interactive show. We want you to be along this with us on this journey of local governance uh, discovery, but also local governance uh, education, because that's the key word that we're going to be trying to do. Well, particularly on my part, I'm going to be trying to educate myself, but also you, the listeners, as we go along this journey. What do you hope the listeners get out of this show at the end of the day? You know, I you made a reference really early on in the introduction, Chris, about how you are passionate about this, and I am too. My, I mean, my hope is kind of that some of this passion runs off a little bit. You also made a reference to teaching and learning and my hope here is that I learned some things through this as well, through you and through some of our other guests. I hope we really illuminate some of the value that is present in local governments now and some of the problems that are being solved around the countries. One of the terms we often use is the, the, the an, uh, adapt, adaptation of best practice, where we actually talk about things being a wise practice. So what happens in Stratford, Ontario may not directly correlate to what's going on in Tumblr Ridge, BC. But maybe the principles do, and maybe we can adapt some of those ideas between the two. And this can be some cross-country learning going on. So your cross-border interviews can turn into some cross-border benefits too. And with our strategic steps, we can take that step together. So with that, we'll be, <laughs> hey, if you're going to throw the, the funny pun in, I will as well, Ian. So we'll Let's be right see where back. This goes. Exactly. We'll be right back after a quick uh, break. And we'll be back with some of the top stories that Ian and I have been noticing across uh, Canada, here in Alberta. And we'll be talking about local governance. We'll be right back, everyone.
Welcome to our news segment where we talk about the biggest news that is happening across Canada from a local governance perspective. And we have to start off with one of the biggest news stories that's happening in, well, relatively large number of provinces here in Canada, and that is municipal elections. Ian, we are in election season municipally and provincially for a lot of provinces right now. What are people heading, where are people heading to the polls? Isn't this exciting? It's kind of like Christmas for those of us who are municipal drunk. And since we don't have our names on a ballot, there's no risk to us either. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, Chris, you're right that more than half of Canadians will be going to the municipal polls over the next month or so, month or two. And so we could see some quite significant changes. We've heard, I've heard anyway, about a lot of mayors of larger municipalities who aren't running for re-election this time. So particularly in Ontario, there's going to be some significant change. But if we look at them over the next little while, as we record this, uh, this segment, uh, October 15th, which is tomorrow for us, uh, British Columbia is going to the polls for their municipal elections throughout the province. So there's a lot of people, obviously, who live there in, in Canada's third most populous province. That's followed the next two days later on the on the Monday, the 17th, with the city of Yellowknife heading to the polls. It's interesting because they're the only municipality in Northwest Territories that's going to the polls as part of this particular election. The Northwest Territories divides their elections up, I think, into three different groups, but Yellowknife's going. Uh, they have a mayor there, who Rebecca Alti, who has uh, been in office now for the last what, three years, 560 odd days, and is running unopposed for mayor, so is likely to be likely to be returned. Uh, a few days after that, October 24th, the largest province in the country, Ontario goes to the polls. And so they will be electing a whole bunch of new council members, a whole bunch of new mayors as well. And we're starting to see some differences happening in Ontario as, in terms of how local government happens, particularly in some of the largest cities. Two days after that, on October 26th, Manitoba and Manitobans will be heading for the polls and electing a new people as well. Now, Manitoba is an interesting one because about a decade ago, actually more than that now, they went through an amalgamation process, quite a significant one. And so there's way fewer municipalities now than there would be 15 or 20 years ago. If you look to a month or so after that, or a few days after that, Prince Edward Island is going on November the 7th. Not a ton of people to be elected there, but it's still one of the, obviously the home of Canadian Confederation. So PEI goes on November 7th. A couple of days after that, on November the 9th, in Saskatchewan, they have a really interesting process. They are going to the polls to elect councillors in their regional, sorry, rural municipalities who represent even numbered divisions. So if there are approximately half, one more or one fewer than half of the elected officials will be changing in their rural municipalities too. So two years from now, there will be another election for the other half, the uh, odd numbered divisions in rural municipalities. If we look next, there's a bit of a break to November the 28th when New Brunswickers will be going to the polls. They are following that uh, lead of places like Manitoba and looking at some significant amalgamations there. Uh, we heard about 50 new municipalities and 12 rural districts will be uh, electing new people or returning existing people. And finally, towards the end of the year, December the 12th, Hamlets in, no in the Northwest Territories will also be electing people. Now, why the Northwest Territories chose December for an election rather than maybe sometime in the summer? It's completely up to them, of course, but NWT Hamlet. So that's a lot of people in a, the, 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 vast, the vast bulk of the geography of the country, as well as the vast bulk of people in the country who are looking at some fairly significant change likely coming up in the next couple of months. Here in Alberta, we have also some by-elections that are coming up to fill some vacancies. Now, I know that you and I, uh, we, we were back and forth on Wednesday, October 12th, because I was at the edge of my seat waiting for those results from high level to come in. But in Alberta, there's a few towns that are actually going to some elections as well. Well, by-elections to fill some vacancies on their councils, correct, as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are there are about half a dozen, give or take, that either have gone to the polls by the time this airs or will be going. And it's interesting to me because this is almost a year to the day to the, to the last general election, which means there has been enough change in some of these municipalities that we're starting to see a requirement to fill some vacancies in some of these places. And some of them have carried a single vacancy for a while. But once if there becomes a time where a second vacancy occurs on the same council, particularly a small council, 
it really becomes onerous on the rest of council to pick up the slack. All of these municipalities we're talking about are have councillors elected at large, so representing the same constituency. But we do see sometimes some of the major urban centers across the country where there are vacancies on a ward-based or division-based uh, uh, way of electing people. And that leaves a chunk of people essentially unrepresented between the time of the resignation and whenever a new person uh, wins, the, wins the vote or is appointed in some municipalities in some, some parts of the country. I think Iqaluit, for example, just appointed somebody to a vacancy in, in, a, in a council. Anyway, you'd reference the Alberta by-elections. You, you also said that the town of high level, which is Northwestern Alberta, uh, was had, a, had an, an election earlier this week as we are talking. The winner got very few votes, which is almost always the case in a by-election. And to me, that's that's really quite troubling because it indicates a lack of engagement, that, that there, there's not enough people who think there is value in actually getting out to vote their local representatives. And it's one of those wicked problems that a lot of people are working on. So anyway, that once happened. Uh, on Monday of the next week, we have a couple of by-elections. One is happening to fill a vacancy in the city of Grand Prairie. And one is in, in the other end of the province in Pincher Creek, also filling a, a, a vacancy. Town of Legal goes on October 24th. Uh, that is just north of Edmonton and they're filling a vacancy. And the town of Rocky Mountain House is going on November the 21st to fill a vacancy. So chances are that that, just judging by the time in advance, that, that was uh, probably fairly recent that that, uh, that resignation or disqualification, I don't know what it was, occurred. And finally, the most interesting one to me anyway, is the new town of Diamond Valley is going to the polls on November 28th. This is a newly amalgamated community. Actually, they don't actually amalgamate until uh, January 1st of next year officially, but they will be electing a joint council on November the 28th, who will take, take office with the new, new community. This, of course, is a, a, an historic collaborative venture between the town of Black Diamond and the town of Turner Valley, and they had chosen the name Diamond Valley as their new community. So I'm really quite interested. I've worked with there a couple of times in both of those former communities, just to see how that all works out for them. So yeah, there are there is going to be some change here in Alberta too. As we head into uh, the winter months, we are seeing uh, municipalities struggle struggle with labor issues, with trying to attract people to bring them into their communities to get them hired. Because let's be honest, right now on a national level, we are seeing a lot of turnover, but we are seeing a lot of labor issues. Some municipalities, and I'm going to just make sure I read off the correct ones here, um, of Quispamis, I apologize if I pronounce that right, New Brunswick, Guysboro, uh, Nova Scotia, and Sackville, No Brunswick, have gone to a four-day-a-week uh, work week, and Merritt, BC, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Merritt, BC, has is piloting this issue, this uh, concept of as well as a four-day-a-week new uh, work week for their municipal staff. What, why is this such a big thing? Because it seems like there may be some want for this, not just in yeah. BC and Atlantic provinces, but across Canada as well. You know, the first time this really came to my attention, first of all, we've been talking about compressed work, the works and four day work weeks for quite a long time. COVID, I think, had an impact on it as well, as, as working people realized that they could be more efficient over a briefer period, perhaps. And they didn't have to travel, didn't have to commute, some of those sorts of things happened. So then we went to a couple of different options. One was looking, say, if we work 40 hours, but we compress it into, a, into four 10, sorry, yeah, four 10 hour days rather than eight, five, eight hour days, one way to do it. The other way is to say, you know what, we're going to go with four eight hour days with the expectation that you're going to be more productive during that time because you've got more time off the weekend. So either of those options are being considered in some. You mentioned several places in New Brunswick. You mentioned Merritt in BC, which tried a compressed work week earlier this year. The township of Springwater, Ontario, which is where I kind of first noticed this, is trying it as well. And I think some of it has to do with work-life balance coming out of the pandemic. Uh, some of them are recognizing that they can keep an office running five days a week with 20% of their staff off at any given time. Uh, you probably want somebody on the front counter, but behind that, whether they're working in the office or whether they're working virtually, some people work better one way or another. So I think they're trying to respond to the changing 
desire for a work-life balance, which therefore will increase things like staff retention. And municipal offices are a place that probably uh, salaries are, while competitive, not really at the high end of what's going on. So we're trying to change, or they're trying to create a culture or build a culture of where there's a team, where we look at hybrid work. They're probably also looking at some things like cost reductions. For example, if we do close the town office for one day a week, we don't have to heat it. We don't have, well, as much. We don't have to clean it as much. And we're rethinking the way work happens too. So I think there's a variety of reasons the four day work week is being considered or being piloted. And interestingly to me, this is not something that would happen without councils being on side with it. So we talk to councils sometimes about the desire, their desire anyway, to be innovative. And then we flip the coin over. We say, well, what kind of risk are you willing to accept as this? And some of this might be blowback from people who say, you know what, I expect four day or five day a week service at the front counter. How come I only have four now? Or why aren't you open as long in the day as you used to be? So this is not all good, I guess, depending on perspective. But I think it is kind of the way we're probably going to go. There's a lot of private industry is doing this. And if we are trying, we as private industry, or sorry, we as people in the public sector are trying to keep those people we've got and maybe attract the next generation, we have to start adapting to that as well. So the four-day work week is is one thing. There may be other innovative ideas which are being tried as well. Uh, Our last big topic that I want to talk about, and we've mentioned it a few times already, but it's the worst word that you could ever say as a municipal councillor, and that is amalgamation. Uh, <laughs> on Monday of this week, as of airing this, uh, we sat down with a Tariq Mayor, Village of Tariq, uh, Saskatchewan Mayor, uh, Mike Strathcan, and he he's talked about amalgamation and how it was a dirty word. Um, we see in Alberta how amalgamation has worked. Uh, and I, I say that as a good thing because we still have a bio, we still have an election for the new municipality of uh, Turner Valley, but the uh, the village, the towns of Turner Valley and Black Diamond and Diamond Valley, I should say, is the there you go. Name. But Turner Valley and Black Diamond have amalgamated, and they are walking out with a new councillor and new mayor on. January 1st, 2023, with a new town of Diamond Valley. Why is amalgamation such a horrible word when it comes to uh, uh, municipal politics? It's interesting you ended up with the word politics. Because uh, I don't think it's a... No, no, I think... No, that's good. I think you're right. Because I think that the politics part of it is the problematic part of it. If you're looking at it in a rational sense of efficiency, sustainability, delivering... Uh, complete set of services, programs, amenities, facilities, all those things, amalgamation in a lot of ways makes sense. Historically, if you want to look at it, we've had many amalgamations when you look at things like regional service commissions or mutual aid agreements or an understanding between two municipalities, hey, we don't need two accountants, let's share one and have a bookkeeper in each place. So those sort of things have been happening over time. Where the amalgamation starts to happen, and let me stress too that amalgamation is different from a dissolution. Some places get to a point where they're just no longer viable, in which case they want to they want to turn out the lights and hand the keys over to somebody. And I mean, presumably because of our Canadian Constitution, a municipality hands the keys back to the province who has to figure out what the heck to do with it. In advance of that, however, there can be conversations that happen between two or more uh, municipalities, which historically may have been viable when Things like communication were more expensive and transportation was more difficult and more expensive. You could keep a couple of towns going a few kilometers apart from each other. But now with increased mobility, uh, increased communication, greater demands for programs and services, it's really hard to be sustainable in some of those small communities when everybody wants a multiplex or another another, uh, sheet of ice or more programs to be offered, another library branch. All these things cost money. All of those were, to your word, a political decision. I ran across a mayor not that long ago who told me that she'd be last, she'd be okay if she was the last mayor of her municipality. But what she was saying to me in that time was, I believe that the needs of the people who live here, the community organizations that operate here, the businesses that are here, need to take precedence over the requirements of elected officials to keep their jobs between, between elections. So what some people, what some municipalities have done is kind of overcome this 
they've gotten rid of that little P politics. And they said, you know, for the betterment of the people who live here over the long term, it works better for us if we only have one municipal administration. If there's only one garbage truck that's going around from place to place to place. If we have snow plows that go where they need to go rather than borrowing them from somebody else or there are shared planning departments. So you made a reference to the town of Diamond Valley where two municipalities, we talked about this a little earlier, where Turner Valley and Black Diamond collaborated in a lot of things anyway. There was almost no space between the two, geographically, physical space between the two municipalities. People don't care where you drew a line on a map. They wanna live in a place that meets their needs and their family's needs now and into the future. He didn't. He he said amalgamation was bad, but he wanted partnerships. He wanted. He didn't want the sure. political motivation of the province coming in and telling them, "Okay, guys, like uh, New Brunswick did in July of this year, saying, okay, we're gonna bring you guys all together and we're gonna bring out fifty new municipalities and twelve new uh, rural districts, and then." do that in Saskatchewan. He didn't want that. He wanted a partnership with Estevan, the closest city or his other yeah. rural district that's around him. So he's looking at it from that perspective. And I can imagine out of COVID-19, out of everything that we've just gone through in the last few years, I I think we might be in a new era of partnership slash amalgamation where cities and rural communities, I should say, are looking for that new chapter and whether that be a joint partnership with another community or a, an actual amalgamation, I could see it happening. I just, it yeah. just seems natural progression in the grand scheme of governance to me. And you, if you look at different models too, these things happen in different ways. And Alberta, where we are, of course, an urban municipality is separate and apart from the rural municipality that surrounds it. Whether it's a, well, interesting point of trivia here, there's no such thing as a county in legislation in Alberta. They're all municipal districts. So I don't know if that learned taught you something or not. The Counties Act was, was actually revoked some time ago when the Municipal Act, Government Act was all made. So they're all whoa, whoa, MDs, whoa, whoa, they just whoa, call whoa, them. Whoa, whoa, counties. whoa, 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 Big Lakes County went from a municipal district to a county from the province's recommendation. Is that not right? Are they still a in municipal name district? only? So they it's there uh, if you look in the municipal government act which is of course our our municipal legislation counties aren't referenced i want to thank you we'll be right back after a quick just uh break and we'll be right back with our closer Ian, uh, this has been fun. It's going to be a little bit different next uh, on November 2nd when we release episode two. But this episode, we've learned about uh, amalgamation, about upcoming elections. So thank you so much. Well, thanks to you, Chris, too. I, uh, it's, it's always fun to do this in a conversational style rather than just as a talking head. So hopefully that uh, helps people when they're listening to this as well. And I'm interested to hear what they have to say, too. That's exactly right, Ian. If you like what you've heard today, hit the subscribe button, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, and share this show with your friends and family. Our message can't get out without you, the listeners and viewers. So share this with your followers or with your friends because it does help us go a long way. And if you do have something that you want to send us, please send it to the political trenches at gmail.com and we look at it and we'll potentially have it in a future episode. So with that, we will be back on November 2nd for another episode of the political trenches, local government at work. 